This is the time of year you should be auditing your dynasty teams. You should be paying particularly close attention to the end of roster guys and the taxi squad players. It's going to come a time, whether it's during the preseason or early in the regular season, but you're going to have to make a decision whether to move on from one of these guys or not. That's why during this quiet period in the fantasy football calendar, it's the perfect opportunity to figure out the players you're comfortable moving on from and those that you're not quite ready to give up on. Now, I recently went through this exercise with my dynasty teams. I came up with 10 guys I'm absolutely not ready to move on from yet. Let's start at the top with one of my favorite rookies from last year's class. Roshan Johnson is a guy I loved coming out of Texas in 2023. He's a big, powerful running back who somehow managed to be productive behind B. John Robinson. He's a natural in the receiving game, both as a pass catcher and in pass protection. And we saw some flashes of that in his rookie campaign. However, overall, it was a disappointing first year for Roshan Johnson. He ran for just 352 yards on 81 carries, and he was mostly relegated to RB3 duties behind Khalil Herbert and Deontay Foreman. If it weren't for an untimely concussion, though, things could have been much different for Roshan Johnson. He began the season backing up Khalil Herbert, but he was ascending in snaps before Khalil Herbert got injured opening up an opportunity atop the depth chart. Unfortunately, Khalil Herbert's injury coincided with a concussion that knocked Johnson out for multiple weeks. So rather than getting his chance to lead the backfield, it opened the door for Deontay Foreman, who excelled and cemented himself into a prominent role for the rest of the season. Still, Roshan Johnson managed three top 24 fantasy performances in five weeks to close out the season. He did that by catching 15 passes from weeks 12 to 17, and he totaled more than 50 yards in four of those five games. Now, with the offseason addition of DeAndre Swift, it's hard to see a clear path to a significant role for Roshan Johnson right now, but Swift was underwhelming from an efficiency standpoint last season, and Johnson did enough late in the year to warrant an opportunity to compete for that RB2 job. And that could turn into a prominent role as a high-end handcuff or eventual starter in what is expected to be a much improved Bears offense with the additions of Keenan Allen and Caleb Williams. I'm not ready to give up on Roshan Johnson after one disappointing season. He was a prospect I had high hopes for, and that really hasn't changed. So we're running it back in 2024. It can't be too surprising that Michael Wilson had a quiet rookie season after injuries held him to just 14 games over his final three seasons in college. Naturally, he lacked a little bit of that experience that's required to make a significant impact as a first-year NFL player. However, Wilson did enough to draw some intrigue heading into year two. He finished the season with 38 receptions and 565 receiving yards, and there were five instances where he was targeted six or more times in a game. In those contests, Wilson averaged 1.94 yards per route and more than 12 fantasy points, according to Fantasy Pros. And that's nothing to scoff at. And don't forget, he was stuck with a combination of Josh Dobbs and Clayton Toon for about half the season. And then with Kyler Murray at the helm, Wilson finished strong with back-to-back -to -back top 24 fantasy performances to round out the season. And now Wilson can use that strong finish to propel him to the number two wide receiver position opposite Marvin Harrison Jr. All that's in his way is Zay Jones. Greg Dortch is going to be the slot guy, and that's a premium position in what's expected to be a potent Cardinals offense. With a healthy Kyler Murray, the additions of Trey Benson and Marvin Harrison Jr., and the ascension of tight end Trey McBride, this could be one of the more explosive offenses in the NFL. And that's only going to benefit a guy like Michael Wilson. Remember, Michael Wilson was a guy who did impress in college when he was healthy, and then he went on and shined at the Senior Bowl. He's a big-bodied playmaker who uses his size and physical strength and body control to create separation and win in the red zone. And he has the athleticism to add value after the catch as well. Michael Wilson has legitimate upside as the wide receiver too in Arizona. He needs to be on the radar in best ball and redraft leagues, and he should be a trade target in Dynasty. It won't cost much to get him, and the payoff could be huge. How cool would it be to have a full-length podcast about your fantasy football league? That would be pretty sweet, right? Well, we offer exactly that at YardsPerFantasy.com. All you need to do is sign up and tell us a little bit about your league. And our team of real fantasy football analysts will break down each team with player evaluations, trade advice, draft strategy. We'll give you a team outlook. 
and we promise not to hold back on the roasting either. Signups are happening right now and there are limited spots available. So head over to yardsperfancy.com and let's get started. I was a big fan of Marvin Mims coming out of Oklahoma last year. He was a big time playmaker in college, leading the Sooners in receiving in all three of his seasons and averaging over 19 yards per reception for his career. And he followed that up with a 4-3-8-40 time at the NFL Combine. That drew Sean Payton's attention too, enough to make Mims his first draft pick as Broncos head coach. And Mims got off to a decent start in Denver. He scored as the wide receiver 18 in week two, and he followed that up with a wide receiver 23 performance in week three. Unfortunately, he never actually cracked the top 50 again though. From then on, Mims struggled to get on the field, reaching a 50% snap share just twice, and he finished his rookie season with just 317 yards on 22 receptions. But the flashes that he gave us early in the season provide at least a little bit of hope that he can be a more consistent presence in the Denver offense in 2024. And that's only going to be helped by the trade of Jerry Judy to Cleveland. So now his competition for the wide receiver two job is going to be rookie Troy Franklin, Tim Patrick is coming off multiple catastrophic leg injuries, Josh Reynolds, Brandon Johnson, and Lil Jordan Humphrey. At worst, Marvin Mims should be Denver's primary deep threat. And that's a role he did well in when given the opportunity as a rookie. It was a small sample, but PFF scored Marvin Mims with the top 30 deep receiving grade. And now into 2024, Marvin Mims has already gotten some positive buzz at off-season workouts from the media. And even coach Sean Payton chimed in, saying Mims' role will expand this season. I don't know if he will ever truly break out of the deep threat mold to become a guy that we can trust in fancy football on a week-to-week -week basis, but I'm not ready to give up on a guy whose profile I was a big fan of coming out of college. I have to be honest, I've never really been a Jahan Dotson guy. He was a fade for me last season, and I was screaming from the rooftops to sell him in Dynasty. However, I am on the wagon for the first time in 2024. And that's not because there's some deep, dark, advanced metric that's indicating a breakout on the way. That honestly just doesn't exist. Jahan Dawson was simply bad last season. Instead, that combination of cost and opportunity are aligning perfectly. Dawson's underdog ADP has fallen all the way to the 12th round. And in Dynasty, he's now the wide receiver 53 on keep trade cut. With a new offense and a new quarterback in Washington, my optimism is pretty high that Dotson can have a productive season in 2024. And if we look back at last season, Curtis Samuel was a pretty big thorn in Jahan Dotson's side, but he's now in Buffalo. And Dotson actually had a few quality performances in games that Curtis Samuel either missed completely or he left early. And now rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels gives us some hope for improved quarterback play, which will only help the cause. Daniels showed us at LSU that he is not afraid to let it rip. And then you got Dotson's speed and playmaking ability, which should pair nicely with Daniels' tendencies and work well as a complement to Terry McLaurin. I mean, I'm still not the biggest Dotson guy. But I'm not panic selling like I've seen a lot of other dynasty gamers do this offseason. Instead, I'm getting him thrown into deals while the cost is low, and then I can just flip him for profit later. Khalil Shakir has given us two seasons of spotty production. He's basically been completely off the radar for the casual fantasy gamer. However, at 24 years old and entering his third NFL season, Khalil Shakir has a chance to become very relevant in 2024. Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis are gone. Those two accounted for nearly 2,000 receiving yards on 241 targets last year. Now, of course, those looks are going to be distributed across a number of guys on the offense, but with no established alpha, there is a real opportunity for someone to step up and be a serious fantasy contributor. Why not Khalil Shakir? He finished out the 2023 season strong with 20 receptions on 22 targets over the last four games, including the playoffs. He scored two touchdowns in the postseason, and he had 105 receiving yards in the regular season finale against the Dolphins. And on the year, Khalil Shakir led all NFL wide receivers in catch rate while accounting for the highest passer rating when targeted and finishing number 16 in receiving EPA. That's all according to Fantasy Pros. In our rookie guide at yardsperfantasy.com back in 2022, I called Khalil Shakir one of the hidden gems in the class. I think we're going to see that come to fruition in 2024. He's now poised to take on a prominent role in the Josh Allen passing attack. We know how valuable that is. He's likely to start in two wide receiver sets 
opposite rookie Keon Coleman while sharing slot duties with free agent signee Curtis Samuel. Now, Khalil Shakir has been almost exclusively a slot guy in the NFL, but if we look back at his Boise State days, we can see he has the versatility to win on the outside as well. And that will only enhance his fantasy football scoring potential. Not only am I not ready to give up on Khalil Shakir in Dynasty, I will be actively targeting him in trades and drafting him in redraft leagues this summer. Trey Palmer had a mostly quiet rookie season after the Bucs drafted him in the sixth round of the 2023 draft. However, he did flash a bit late in the season with a wide receiver 20 finish in week 17, which he followed up with a 56-yard touchdown in Tampa's playoff win over the Eagles. I liked Palmer coming into the league last year after he finished his college career with a record-setting season at Nebraska. However, it was obvious it was going to take him a little bit of time to develop into a consistent contributor. After sitting behind studs at LSU for multiple seasons, Palmer didn't get much of a chance to play until his one year at Nebraska. Now, with a year of NFL experience under his belt, maybe now is the time that we see Trey Palmer take the next step. And with Chris Godwin expected to move back into the slot in 2024, that opens an opportunity at Z in the box offense. And it's expected that Trey Palmer and rookie third round pick Jalen McMillan are going to compete for that job in training camp. This is an offense that ran 11 personnel about 75% of the time in 2023. So one of these guys is going to get on the field quite a bit. And Palmer adds an element to the offense that Jalen McMillan doesn't in that speed. Remember, Trey Palmer, who is a former special teams ace, ran a blazing 4-3-3 at the 2023 NFL Combine. So even if Jalen McMillan is the starting Z, the Bucs are going to want to rotate Palmer in for that added speed. And that opens the door for some spike weeks that makes Trey Palmer particularly appealing late in best ball drafts. And if he develops into that more well-rounded wide receiver and he beats out Jalen McMillan altogether, we could see a second year breakout from Trey Palmer. Jalen Tolbert has given us two years of mostly nothing in terms of production. After the Cowboys drafted him in the third round of 2022, Tolbert played just 89 snaps as a rookie. Now, he did take a significant jump in that category in 2023, improving to 477 snaps while playing in all 17 games and collecting seven starts. But the slow start to his career really isn't a surprise despite the third round draft capital. I even noted this in my analysis of Jalen Tolbert in the Yards Per Fantasy Rookie Guide back in 2022. And this is exactly what I said. I said Jalen Tolbert will likely take some time before he gets on the field in a full-time capacity. Don't expect to get an immediate return on your investment. And that's exactly how things have played out so far. But I also expressed optimism that Jalen Tolbert would develop into a fantasy contributor over time. I mean, overall, I did like him coming out. He's a fast, versatile athlete who dominated over his last two years at South Alabama. And now the door is wide open for a third year breakout. Michael Gallup is gone and the Cowboys didn't add any wide receiver of consequence in free agency or the draft. Get out of here with Ryan Flournoy. So not only is Jalen Tolbert in the driver's seat for the wide receiver three job, but Dallas's number two, Brandon Cooks, appeared to take a step back in 2024, and he's going to turn 31 years old in September. And don't even get me started on what could happen if CeeDee Lamb were to miss some time. There is no better way to get ready for fantasy football drafts than building your own projections. But maybe you don't know how to make your own projections, or the task of setting them up has stopped you from doing them. But that's not an excuse anymore. At YardsPerFantasy.com, we have the world's greatest projections template. It is fully customizable for any scoring settings and loaded with features for the most experienced projections builders. But at the same time, it's so easy to use and comes with a complete guide and video tutorial that even first-time users find it a breeze to make their own projections. It's completely preloaded so you can start right away and you have the power to make it as simple or as complex as you'd like. So check out our projections template. It's less than 10 bucks and it's available now at yardsperfantasy.com. Building projections has never been this easy. I will never quit Antonio Gibson. There are not many running backs who have gotten more hate from the fantasy football community over the last couple of years than Antonio Gibson. 
yet we're quick to forget how productive he was over the first two years in the NFL. He had over 1,000 yards from scrimmage as a rookie, and he ran for another 1,000 yards in his second season while scoring double-digit touchdowns in both years. The emergence of Brian Robinson and the distrust from the Ron Rivera coaching staff led to Gibson's downfall over the last two years in Washington. But now in New England and still only 26 years old, Gibson has a chance to resurrect his career. He's sitting behind one of the NFL's most overrated running backs in Ramondre Stevenson with an opportunity to at least seize the pass catching role. And Gibson was highly productive in the receiving game in Washington after converting from wide receiver to running back in college. He caught 172 passes for 1,283 yards in his four seasons. It's also not crazy to think that Antonio Gibson could overtake Ramondre Stevenson atop the depth chart if Stevenson proves ineffective or if the coaching staff prefers the more explosive traits that Gibson brings to the table. And despite the limited role that he played in 2023, Antonio Gibson's efficiency numbers were still good. He averaged over 8 yards per reception with an 81.4% catch rate. Both of those numbers were top 12 among running backs, according to Player Profiler. He was also number four in yards per touch, number 12 in evaded tackles per touch, and sixth in fantasy points per opportunity. And again, that's according to Player Profiler. And remember, Antonio Gibson is not this little scat back, this little receiving back. He's a big 228-pound man of a running back with 438 speed. If he ever gets the chance to lead a backfield again, Antonio Gibson has all the upside. Even in a shared backfield with Ramondre Stevenson, Gibson's going to provide value for your fantasy team this season. I liked Evan Hall coming out of Northwestern last year. Unfortunately, an early season injury killed his rookie campaign after just two touches. He's back for 2024, though, with a chance to be the Colts' number two running back behind Jonathan Taylor. And remember, that's a role that Zach Moss thrived in last year and ultimately propelled him to a nice free agent contract with the Bengals. But Moss being gone opens up the door for Evan Hall to reclaim his spot. And as we saw with Zach Moss, it's a very fantasy-friendly opportunity. If anything were going to happen to Jonathan Taylor and Hall is the number two, he's going to wind up in a lot of starting fantasy lineups. Evan Hall is a good athlete at 209 pounds and 447 speed. He runs well between the tackles, but he was especially celebrated for his pass-catching skills coming out of college. He caught 88 passes over his last two years at Northwestern, and he possesses reliable hands and a healthy route free. Hull will add value as the team's third down back, with plenty of upside as a high-end handcuff. And yet, it feels like the fantasy football community has just completely forgotten about him. His underdog ADP is in the 18th round, and he's being valued as the Dynasty RB71 on Keep Trade Cut. I'm taking advantage of these prices while they last. I know, I know, I know, I'm crazy, I know, but I'm still leaving the light on for Rashad Bateman. Bateman was an exceptional prospect coming out of Minnesota. He was a pure alpha in college and he checked a lot of boxes. However, injuries and a number of other factors have led to a disappointing first three NFL seasons. But he's finally healthy and he's primed to be the number two wide receiver in Baltimore in 2024. Whether you like it or not, he's going to start in two wide receiver sets across from last year's first rounder, Zay Flowers. And while a fourth year breakout is probably unlikely, it's not unprecedented. He could be the next Devontae Parker, who did very little until year five, and then he gave us multiple fantasy relevant seasons, including a wide receiver 14 finish in 2019. It's crazy, but it's not that crazy. I mean, it has to be somewhat encouraging that the Ravens just gave him a two year contract extension. If they still believe in him, why shouldn't we?